Hey yo party peeps, Sons of the Forest has come a long way since its release and according to my last tips video there are a lot of you looking to make the most out of your time on the island. There is one main commonality across many of the comments on that video. Each these tips are just for beginners. I already knew all of these tips. Thumbs down. Deej, this game has been updated three times since you put this video out. Why didn't you include any of the new stuff in this video? Here's the deal. If you just want to skip straight to the tips, the timestamps are all right there below. But I just wanted to take a quick sec to let you know how hard we have been working to get to our goal of 1,000 subscribers. And if I give you every single obscure, advanced, or unusual tip that I can think of, you gotta promise to ring that bell when I hit you with the first one you haven't seen before. You got a deal? Now, with that out of the way, let's dig into it. First, we're gonna start off with some quick and easy tips for the moment you touch down on the island. As you're running around, you'll see that all consumables will have a question mark directly above them. To get a quick and easy gauge on whether something is good or bad for you, just take a quick bite as you're flying by and the question mark will turn to red or green to denote if it's good or bad for you. Well, Deej, what if I don't wanna go through all that work and I just want it spelled out for me like a child? Yeah, sure. Here are the foods that provide either only a limited benefit, deal damage with no benefit whatsoever, or some equally pointless mixture of the two. I wouldn't say you have to avoid all of these, as they can provide at least some hydration or fullness, but they're basically so low that it's not worth the extra effort of going out of your way to get them. Aside from that, fireweed and guarana berries are the biggest sleepers that you should collect, with aloe vera, chicory, shiitakes, and oysters offering at least a little bit of healing. Raw fish is better than raw meat, but both will fill you for 50 and heal 25 hit points once cooked. Eating the burnt versions of either of these reduces their fullness output a little bit, but now with a penalty to your hydration and a drastic reduction in healing output. So they're basically the good version of ramen noodles, unless you're literally standing right next to a river. All of the bite cubes are basically useless until end night adds in the cooking or crafting system that's rumored to be around the corner. Cat food and crunchies will fill you up for 30 and 50 respectively, but it's no surprise that the big winners for consumables are the MRE, which got a recent bump to 75 fullness and good old fashioned water, which will hydrate you for 50, whether from a canteen or from a stream. The last consumables to cover are the energy sources, with the energy bar giving 10 fullness and 40 caffeinated rest, and the energy drink offering 50 hydration and 20 caffeinated rest as well. The energy mix gives you 20 caffeinated rest with the energy mix plus doubling its benefits to 40, and getting off the game and going to get some actual sleep is still the best way to recover, huh? Speaking of food, they're basically of no real value and only have a fullness value of two, but turtle eggs are also a consumable item and happen to be one of the most common consumables people seem to be missing for that foodie achievement. 0.4% of gamers? Really? Eat the turtle eggs. Now that you have your noms and you're ready to explore, here's a few quick tips to stay alive while you're out and about. Take those arms and legs you hopefully didn't eat and save them for going out in deep water. If you or an ally needs to go for a swim but you don't want to get munched, you can distract sharks from attacking you by throwing a limb into the water instead. If you happen to find yourself out of fresh limbs and still need to take a quick dip, make sure to throw on the wetsuit if you have it to move nearly twice as fast as any other combination of clothing. While you probably wouldn't be able to outswim a shark anyway, you can benefit from being selective in your wardrobe on land as well. I've seen a lot of videos suggesting that the comfort rating means this or that or the other, but right now I can say that it just affects your speed. PJs make you run super fast, wetsuit makes you run super slow, and anything in between has a corresponding benefit. There's also talk of a sanity system being implemented into Sons of the Forest in the future that may impact this, but for right now you can just consider your comfort rating a land-based speed rating. While what you wear can impact your speed, it can also highly impact your ability to stay warm and take damage. When it comes to armor, tech armor is the clear standout at absorbing the most. Creepy armor directly behind it, and then bone armor, the third most protective armor available right now. Hide armor offers at least a little protection, but is only slightly better than leaf armor, which is basically like wearing construction paper. While these armors are basically trash at protection, Hide armor does increase both your thermal and stealth ratings with each piece, with the leaf armor providing a 10% boost to your stealth for each piece you're wearing as well. So, since you're not good in combat with these armors, they are at least good at helping you avoid it. The golden armor might as well be tin foil against most enemies, but does offer massive damage mitigation against demons. 
That said, it actually makes you colder while you're wearing it, so I'd recommend only putting it on when you know you're going to be fighting those demons. Even with tech armor obviously providing the most protection, it is also hugely resource expensive to craft and can't be as easily replaced as a lot of other armors. The only problem is you can only get one piece of creepy armor per mutant you kill. However, instead of wasting time figuring out who needs the armor the most, if you're in a multiplayer group, you can get as many pieces from a single mutant as you need if you all approach the mutant at the same time and activate the harvesting prompt together. One body, armor for everyone. If you end up getting your ass kicked despite being completely armored and brought to the edge of death, here's a couple quick considerations that you should probably know about your health. When you're brought down to almost zero, the game will automatically give you a boost to 15% of your health as long as you don't take damage for a short while. Also, while you may be tempted to pop the meds the second you start running away, just be careful. Meds, Healing Mix, Healing Mix Plus, and any foods that heal over time will immediately stop working if you take even a point of damage from any source. So make sure you've bought yourself at least a little breathing room if you're going to need it. To prevent you from being in either of these situations in the first place, a couple quick combat considerations. When facing a large group of villagers attacking, you can keep any number of them at bay by holding up a head from another dead villager. It won't be enough to scare off heavies, but for smaller enemies and large groups, it is a quick and easy way to gain space. Also when dealing with smaller enemies, there are three different archetypes for the male villagers that are all reasonably similar in terms of aggression and behavior, but there are two models for the female villagers that seem to behave very differently. No matter what situation they're in or how much you attack the other villagers, the females dressed in modern clothing will never attack you. They will run, react to other villagers taking damage, but they are not a threat to you, so prioritize accordingly in groups. When you do find an opponent looking to square up, blocking can mitigate a pretty considerable amount of damage depending on the weapon you use. However, if you're either brave or feeling a little more comfortable with the timing, you can actually take no damage on a parry success. If you're low on health or you don't have enough stamina left to block a series of attacks, you can work in a parry at a cost of zero stamina to save your life. When it comes to the elite villager enemies that can't be parried, scared off, or blocked, simply backing up and sidestepping can be enough to avoid danger. By moving straight back and timing a sidestep, you can avoid the fat man's leap and the heavy's kick and both of their melee combos. You can also rock forward and back in close quarters to bait out their attacks for easy dodges. And I actually did this so long with a fat and a heavy that they both became completely exhausted and one even needed a quick lunch break in the middle of the fight. So this is a pretty effective strategy for however long you need it to be. Speaking of the heavies, I've seen a lot of videos talking about the difference between the gold mask and the faceless or comparing the different heavies to one another. Can you tell just from looking at these three which one has more health? Well, you're probably wrong, cause look, they're all the same. What about these two puffy enemies? Which one should you be worried about? Well, neither, really. It's just the male and female version of the exact same enemy. What about these two puffies? Is one of these puffies more dangerous than the other? Yes, hugely. One is actually a puffy boss and one is a regular puffy. Other than being a slightly larger version of the original form, there's no clear separation between them unless you're out at night. You can actually tell a puffy boss from a regular puffy by looking for the pulsing blue glow to let you know you're in for a much tougher fight. As a final throwaway note on dealing with heavies specifically, if you happen to fight any of the fatties during the winter months and have a frozen lake nearby, turns out they have trouble with it from time to time and will actually hockey puck themselves across it to give you a little free time. There's probably not much for you to actually capitalize on here but a funny inclusion that I think a lot of people haven't seen. If you happen to find yourself in a position of advantage anyway and have the drop on a villager encampment, never underestimate the power of using the silencer. It actually makes the pistol, uh, well, silent. To the levels of ridiculousness that rival the producers of John Wick. Anytime you have a group all in one place but they haven't seen you, a few well-aimed shots from a distance with the silencer can make a tough fight basically a non-event. If you're more of a run and gun type person, because of course you are, then you're probably using the shotgun. There's nothing bad about that. However, the discourse and videos I've seen thus far seem to be centered around Buckshot having a vastly superior output to the slug. To some extent, there's a matter of preference to be considered, but the slug round actually deals far more damage and are far more accurate at a distance than Buckshot. One isn't better than the other, they're just designed to do two very different things, and from what I've seen, it seems like a lot of folks may not know that. So, now you do.
Even still, if you're one of those buckshot for life Sons of the Forest players that's sitting on a ton of spare slugs, you can always keep your buckshot freshly stocked by using slugs to reload your shotgun. If you run out of shells and need to reload, just aim towards the ground, hold the reload button to switch your ammo type to slugs, and then reload the shotgun, switching back after you're finished to fire off your buckshot rounds. The gun will fire whatever ammo you have selected as long as it's loaded, but will only consume whichever ammo type you're on when you go to reload. So pick whichever ammo you like. It's basically all the same ammo as long as you're conscious about how you're reloading it. So now you're charging into an enemy camp fully stocked, but even with a powerful weapon, you can still add a little fun to these encounters. Many of the villager camps throughout the world will keep mutant puppies tied to posts on opposite ends of their encampments. Did you know that you can actually cut these ropes and have them run free to cause problems in the camp? But be careful, these puffies will attack the villagers, but they'll also attack you. So be sure to choose your moments wisely. On the note of inner enemy conflict, villagers will fight mutants, demons, and muddies all basically with the same approach. None of the different kinds of enemies seem to like each other, and they will become hostile on sight as if they were looking at you. There are rare cases where you can use this to your advantage by running two groups into one another, but you'll notice this later in game when mutants actually begin taking over villager encampments as their conflict evolves. The one exception to this is the demons and mutants, which apparently have worked something out as they see eye to eye and do not fight each other. If you want to avoid conflict with the villagers entirely, all you need to do is keep a mask at the ready. If you're wearing the red or gold mask, villagers will basically ignore you to do more exciting things like taking a walk, exploring the world, sit in hut. However, there will be rare occasions where villagers will also pray to you if you are wearing a mask the color of the mask doesn't seem to matter. You can fool the natives as long as you keep the mask on, but as soon as you drop it, you are immediately on the menu. That said, you can quickly join the hunting party like you were there the whole time if you simply break line of sight and put the mask back on. Oops, stupid cannibals. As fun as all this is, there will probably come a point in time where you realize that you need to build a base. Fortunately, there are tons of videos on great locations to build them and ensure your ultimate safety with great defenses. And they're all wrong. Seeking isolation or difficult environments can certainly reduce your likelihood of running into enemies, but there is no stronger defense than just six inches of water. Despite them clearly having no issue traversing rivers, none of the island's enemies are willing to go into salt water. Just lay a foundation down in the ocean shallows, and any threats that approach will end up staring at you while you build up your base in peace. As you start building your mega mansion, a couple quick things to know about lights. First, from all of the testing that I have done, it doesn't seem that there is any limit on how many lights can be powered by a single panel, and there is no restriction on how far away those lights can be. So if you're like me and thought there would be some kind of measured power consumption similar to rust, for example, then you're probably using way too many panels. Second, if you're like me and find the orange wiring is a little bit too much of a standout on the rustic look of a log cabin, you can always wire across the supports in the floor to run power across rooms while keeping the least amount of wiring visible. It doesn't really change how they perform or function, but it does look nicer if that's something you're into. And a last quick couple things to keep in mind as you are building your base, but before you finish it. First, anytime that you are indoors during the winter, you receive a slight warmth bonus to your thermals. But what counts as a structure for the purposes of this bonus? Well, turns out all you need is a roof, four corners, and a wall on each side that is at least two logs high. Even if you cut open a window or door, as long as it is a two log wall, it'll still provide you that interior benefit. Once you get at least a few of these short walls set up, I would also advise that you set up a quick transport zip line that can take you directly in and out of your base. All that you have to do is attach a zip line to a wall that is finished by shooting it through a wall that is unfinished. Once you've hooked the line up, you can actually complete the unfinished wall without affecting the zip line itself. From there, you can move freely through into and out of your base through that wall without having to resort to rope systems or huge moats or whatever else these videos are trying to have you do. If you want a base with no door that still lets you move freely, this is a cool and easy way to do it. The reason this is such an important tool is because you should also be setting up full zipline networks to quickly reach important resource locations. Maybe you can give your friends a quick start from crash site all the way to being ready to go, or you just want easy access to a 3D printer, or maybe you have a large network of satellite bases scattered throughout the island. 
Whatever the reasoning is, using your zip lines to quickly travel and having that be a permanent fixture on your game is a huge benefit to you that you should probably be investing in. So now you're set up in an untouchable base with easy access in and out and you can move quickly around the island as you wish. However, there's likely to be many of you that already have your base somewhere that doesn't have these benefits. Well, there's tons of great videos on cool and creative ways to defend your base, and I cover a few tips in my previous tips video if you want to check that out. But the two lesser known things that I'll point out is your wall and log. Specifically, if you don't chop every single log tip around the entire perimeter of your wall, it results in a stretch of three logs on either side of it that enemy AI will consider traversable. So if you miss just one spot, you can have two enemies climbing over at a time. And in regard to logs, don't underestimate the power of a simple deadfall trap. They're extremely resource cheap, extremely quick to set up and reset, and actually deal a pretty considerable amount of damage and occasionally will stagger. It's definitely not the most efficient trap, but at the cost of a single log and a single stick, you can spam these across the surrounding area to create something of a nightmare of landmines that it'll be really difficult to get through. All you have to do is place a log on the ground, raise it up with a stick, and bam, you're done. Instant trap. The chainsaw, on the other hand, is a hugely effective tool for tree removal, but also a devastating weapon against all enemy types. However, most people don't seem to know that if you hold a block while you're wielding the chainsaw, it starts a perpetual rev that actually ticks its attack damage nearly four times as fast as swinging it. So, the next time you're out chopping trees and find yourself outnumbered, just rev it up and charge forward. Choosing the right weapon for the right job can be a little challenging in some circumstances, but another thing to keep in mind if you're leaning into archery is that the bow you use and the ammo can have a huge difference in their effectiveness. The crafted bow with stone arrows deal measly damage, have almost no range, and are super inaccurate. However, the carbon arrows will improve all of these downfalls a little bit, but it's the 50% boost from using the compound bow that will actually make the most difference. Add to that an additional 10% boost on headshot damage, and even the difference between them on mid-tier enemies can become painfully apparent. Make sure you're choosing wisely. But which arrow type deals the most damage, Deej? Well, turns out it's actually crossbow bolts. At 50 damage a piece, the crossbow actually has the highest damage output of any standard weapon in the game. However, its extremely slow reload means that its overall damage per second doesn't quite measure up to a lot of other options. So, if you have a crossbow with you, I'd recommend getting max value out of it by using it at range first, and then switching to a higher DPS weapon from there as you close in or continue to shoot. Similar to knowing which weapon to use, knowing how to use it can be just as important. I've already seen at least a few videos talking about the cross and how its damage works that are clearly uh, wrong. For the sake of making it easy and as simple as can be, it deals more damage the closer you are to the target. I've tested this a lot, unfortunately, and unexciting as it is, I promise you it's that simple. When it comes to melee weapons, most people rightly understand that power attacks deal more damage than standard attacks. But did you know that most melee weapons have an alternate animation when you're using a power attack looking at the ground? These attacks are designed to finish off grounded and stunned enemies and have a slightly different hitbox than their standard counterparts. They don't deal any more damage, but it is possible to have them hit multiple times instead of just once, depending on the location and kind of enemy. It's not reliable enough to say that you can plan around it or build it into combat purposefully, but it is a happy surprise as well as a much cooler animation, in my opinion. One of the funniest examples of this is actually with the putter, where the standard power attack is a bludgeoning swing, but the ground attack is a full-on Shooter McGavin-style tee-off. While this is probably an unusual kind of attack to use effectively, you actually might have more fun using this attack on the golf course on the far side of the island. If you get there, you can drop a golf ball right there on the tee and play a full nine if you have the time and... Uh, uh, well, patience to find your ball in the absolute mess of textures, but uh, give it a try. An interesting thing to keep in mind if you're gonna head to this golf course on foot is you can actually fish out a fair few goodies from the large lakes that you pass along the way. As of right now, I haven't found anything outside normal materials and resources, but not only do I hope that the devs hide away some fun secrets and lakes in the future, I actually think it makes a lot of sense for them to do based on some of the interesting set pieces and dioramas they've already crafted. I would definitely be on the lookout for this in the future. 
If you feel you don't have time for recreation because you've seen a video that suggested whatever you do, you should do it quick because the natives continue to gain more health each day you're on the island, turns out no, that's just not true. However, you will see enemies appearing in greater numbers with more elites and more importantly, wearing extra armor. While their health doesn't seem to go up at all, even within the first 10 days, you'll begin to see native combatants showing a few pieces of leaf or hide armor, but quickly as you get up there in days, you'll see villagers wearing full suits of bone armor and creepy armor as well. So you certainly don't have to rush through, but know that even standard mundane enemies can pose more of a threat down the line. Now it's also been said that you get stronger each day you're on the island. While there is some truth to that, it turns out it's a little more complex than you think. Guns, Nerds, and Steel has a great video on all of the specifics if you want a 100% deep dive how strength works, but in short, anytime you swing a weapon or pick up a log, you gain a little bit of strength. This gain isn't affected by power attacks, the type of weapon, and it actually scales exponentially as your strength levels up. Your strength score doesn't impact the amount of damage you deal or your resistance to damage. The only benefit of increasing your strength seems to be a very slight boost to health, with your total hit points increasing by two with each new strength level. That's it. Hopefully it has a greater impact in the future, but for now, it's just this slight boost, I'm afraid. Regardless of your strength level, if you find that you're getting swarmed by a huge crowd and you are low on health and stamina, you can always Always freeze combat in place by quickly opening your inventory. While you're in your inventory, you can actually fully regen your health and stamina, and then go on fighting as if you were fresh in the fight. A couple quick things to note here though is this only works in solo play and cannot pause combat in multiplayer. And two, you always pick up right where you left off. So be mindful. At this point, you should probably be more than set up to avoid being in that situation in the first place, but presuming that you do have issues while you're playing in a multiplayer lobby, don't immediately choose to respawn if you go down. Much like Virginia and Kelvin, if you go down, an ally can always bring you back in the fight if a window of opportunity presents. Even if you don't come back in time for the fight, you can at least stand back up where you are instead of having to meander back from whatever respawn point you're thrown at. Now, even if you're pre-experienced and prefer playing on your own, there is still value in playing in an online lobby as it removes the two limit death that you have while playing single player. If you die twice in single player, that's all she wrote. But if you die in a multiplayer room, you always just respawn at the nearest respawn location. While this inclusion is maybe not so much a tip as much as an extra consideration, as a secondary precaution, this may be something you want to consider as well. If you're anything like me, you absolutely hate respawning in the ocean. But I can remove at least one component of fear here by letting you know that you can't drown after respawning underwater. The HUD indicators for drowning don't actually start until you've cut yourself loose, so if the unfortunate timing of you receiving a merch delivery happens to coincide with your untimely and watery death, go sign for that package. There's no fear of drowning until you actually free yourself from that respawn point. Also, link in the description. When running through caves, however, you're not likely to have to worry about spawning in water. However, the dark and twisting cavernous interior is still a large threat and will likely pose plenty of challenge for most. However, these caves can be made much easier for both you and anyone else attempting to run them in the future by just utilizing small builds. You can illuminate interiors with torches, mark your path to travel, or even fill choke points with deadly traps to minimize the risk of dealing with large groups. You can only do this so much before you run out of materials that you bring with you, but if you run through caves on separate instances or you just like exploring to see what else there is to find, you can take a lot of fear and risk out of these caves just by making a few quick additions to the interior. Speaking of traps, the Spring Trap is a recent addition to the game that offers a ton of fun and interesting versatility. Not only does it one-shot smaller humanoid enemies, but you can also place it at your feet while walking to give yourself a quick boost up to high location. As fun and useful as this can be, the same approach can actually be used to turn the Spring Trap into an offensive weapon as well. Instead of placing it under yourself, you can place it directly under an enemy's feet to see them spring up into the air as if they had run over the trap themselves. Collecting the trap also so immediately resets it. So you can become some weird mixture of Bob the Builder and John Wick if you're into it for the lulls. That said, it does not work on big enemies. 
so apply the strategy with caution. In addition to the boost that you can get when placing it yourself or using it as a weapon, using it when you are riding the Knight 5 can increase this boost to nearly cartoony levels of hang time. Be aware that moving too fast when you set it down will result in a wreck, but otherwise it will shoot you higher and farther than you'd likely think. In addition to the fun that this combination provides by itself, it also eliminates the frustration of having to find some arbitrarily high point to launch your glider. All you have to do is carry the glider, ride your Knight 5 over a spring trap like mentioned previously, and boom, instant launch pad. Now you don't have to trek your glider around to get far and fast, you simply launch from wherever you want. Also, in regard to the Knight 5 itself, here are a few really quick tips that I have found super helpful that you might not have known. Your alignment on the Knight 5 is always centered, which means you move forward when holding W, same as while walk. However, it does not turn with your head, which often makes driving difficult due to the disconnect between running and riding. So to make sure you are cruising fast and far, just avoid looking left and right while you're riding it. If you do find yourself off center, you can always quickly realign yourself by looking down at the wheel or remounting the Knight after getting off to instantly recenter. As you are driving through the forest, the Night 5 will also destroy any vegetation that it runs over, but has the added benefit of automatically collecting it for you if you have room in your inventory. Farming leaves and seeds becomes an absolute breeze with just a short trip through the forest if you happen to be in need of either. And my last tip for the Night 5 is that you may have found yourself riding around all day only to find that when dusk comes, you're not quite back to your base yet but you're close enough where you don't want to throw down a new save. Well, if you get off your Night 5 and hold it while it's dark out, it can also be used as an emergency flashlight, no batteries required. Just make the rest of the trek home. And now to round us out with some obscure or unusual tips to add to your utility while exploring, if you come across any camps or crash sites, you'll often find these little red propane containers on the ground. It turns out they can actually be shot to cause damage to nearby enemies, they deal no damage to friendlies, and even provide a brief stun window if it hits. Just be careful, they definitely will deal damage to you. For similarly unconventional and unusual weaponry, the most plentiful weapon you can find in the game is actually a lot closer than you think. Just like the damage of the log is underestimated with the deadfall trap, literally just chucking a log can actually be a fun and effective weapon for enemies as well. The hitbox is huge. More importantly, it often causes knockdown or stagger, and let's face it, it's easily one of the funniest ways to kill an enemy in game. So consider this if you haven't already. And when you're done throwing around these massive death sticks, make sure you bring one back to your base to chop into quarters and then chop those quarters in half to make firewood. Inconsequential as it might seem, a basic fire only burns for two hours in game, with the duration of all types of fires being drastically reduced in colder seasons. Reinforcing a fire can double its duration, but the addition of firewood means a fully fueled and reinforced fire can literally burn for more than a day in game time. So whether it's to have a bright beacon to guide you home at dusk or have it ready to cook whatever you bring back when you're adventuring, firewood is a hugely slept on benefit that it seems very few people take advantage of. Once you got this fire going back at base, I would also recommend building out your bag to be more base oriented once you've gotten enough weapons to fill your hotkeys. Optimize your bag for building so it's reasonably quick to access and use your hotkeys mostly for combat. My bag has a quick supply of food, water, energy, and emergency health just in case, as well as a rock, stick, tracker, and chainsaw for building near or far depending on what project I'm working on. Consider trading out the tracker for the cross later in game as the cross probably doesn't merit a dedicated hotkey spot but can be of benefit later in the game. I also use hotkeys 1 through 6 for my weapons, but I do keep the shovel, rope gun, and tarp on 7 through 9 as these are exploratory staples that also often come up. Do make sure that you're optimizing your bag and your hotkeys separately so you never fumble or have to dive into your inventory when you're under attack. And my last tip for your base before I give you one that's going to change the way you play is regarding Kelvin, everyone's favorite fish catching log gathering idiot. Well, as much as he tends to be the workhorse of any base location, you also need to keep him happy and rested. It turns out that Kelvin needs rest just as much as you do, and anytime he is working on something, he'll need to take periodic breaks and forcing him to work when he is too low on energy will cause him to become upset. If he becomes too upset, he'll even begin refusing orders if he's too tired or stressed. 
It's always hard to get a gauge for where he might be at with these, but if he is taking rest on his own, it is best to just leave him rest. Otherwise, he may begin refusing to help you when you need it most. And now the moment you may or may not have been waiting for, depending on your exploration of the timestamps. My last tip for this video is to cheat. Stay with me, I know how that sounds, but if you have an idea for a cool and awesome mega structure, don't limit where you build it to a location exclusively with resources nearby. Maybe you have difficulty navigating through the caves because it's so dark, you can turn on a light. Or you find the tedium of staying warm during the winter annoying, because it is, make it summer. Give yourself super speed or tons of toys to play with, or maybe you just want to build a Mario Kart style death race for you and your friends. Video on that maybe coming soon. Let me know if you'd be interested in that. Whatever your reasonings or motives are, this game has a great story and difficulty, UI, or interactivity shouldn't be a hurdle to being able to experience it. I can promise you, as someone who's put a lot of time into this game, these tools have only added to the fun that I've been able to have with it, so I highly advise you to make the game experience the way that you want to make it for the most fun that you can have. All you have to do to access this with no mods, third-party add-ins, or secondary software of any kind is just type in the word cheat stick, all one word, and press F1. If done correctly, pressing F1 thereafter will bring up the in-game admin debug menu, which will allow you to give yourself all kinds of toys and spawn in all kinds of enemies or any combination of weird variables you want to play with. So that's it. Those are my advanced tips, or at least tips that are lesser known that I hadn't seen anyone else cover. If you found this video particularly helpful, please consider subscribing. Leave a comment with which tip was your favorite or that you found the most helpful. And if you didn't learn anything new, maybe leave a comment to uh, help others with something I could have included here. Until I see you next time. Party on.